Hi everyone and welcome to Tutorbox Live in conjunction with COVID-19 catch-up courses. I know, I know, what a time to be alive. My name is Kiara Blows and I am going to be your Tutorbox Physical Sciences Tutor. I currently study Biomedical Sciences at Newcastle University in the United Kingdom. It is a pleasure to virtually meet all of you and I hope you are staying safe and having a great day. So without further ado, grab your notebook, your writing materials, the worksheets and perhaps a coffee and a water to get through this and let's get started. Hi everyone and welcome to week one, lesson one, physics vectors in two dimensions. As you know, I am Cara Blows. This is a reminder that there is a Q&A after the session where hopefully all your questions and queries will be answered. All right, so our first topic will be the resultant of perpendicular vectors. So note that I am using the word vectors here. However, most of these examples do um, use force, but acceleration, velocity, etc., as they are dealt in the same way because they are all vectors. So this first example is in your worksheet if you would like to follow along. So we're going to consider these vectors sketched below. There's a 1 Newton force upwards, a 4 Newton force downwards, 2.5 Newtons to the left, 1.5 and a 5 Newton to the right. Okay, so what we're going to first do is define which is considered the positive direction for each axis. So I've made the right positive and the upwards positive. Next, you're going to redraw or calculate to show the resultant of each of these axes. Very, very important note here, you must give them direction if you're writing or you use the arrowheads, because as that will show direction. And we should get the following. So you should have a resultant x vector of 4 newtons and a resultant y vector of 3 newtons. How you get that is we've taken the five and the one and a half as the positive. We've minus two and a half and you got four. We've taken the four newtons minus the, the one, which gives you three downwards in the negative direction. Next, you complete your diagram by filling in the resultant and your theta. The vectors do have to be redrawn so that they're head to tail. And that's why we've moved the ry to the right and we have the resultant from tail to head. Tail to tail does exist. If anybody would like me to go over that, just let me know. Next, we work out the resultant using Pythagoras. So your resultant squared is equal to four squared plus three squared. Your resultant is therefore 16 plus nine, which is 25 and you square root that and you get a five. Another important thing is don't forget to work out the angle. This angle is what your direction will be. Another important thing is always use the numbers that have the least amount of working out to them. So don't use your resultants in these calculations, use the Rx and the Ry. So we say tan of theta is equal to opposites over adjacent, so 3 over 4, and we get 36.9 degrees. Your answer is therefore the resultant is 5 newtons to the right at 36.9 degrees down from the horizontal. Another important tip is that the angle is always at the tail side if you are using the head to tail method. All right, so our next section is going to be on parallel and perpendicular components. So this is just building on what we have just done. The reason why we do this, it is very often useful to resolve a vector into the components to calculate the overall effect. It can be very difficult if they're all at different angles, and so if you resolve them into two and then work out the result from that, it becomes a lot easier. So when a force acts at an angle, it will tend to pull the objects along the horizontal and potentially lift it, if it is pulling upwards from the horizontal, for example. If it is pushing downwards, what could happen is you could increase the weight component and therefore the normal, but we'll get into that later. So the greater the angle to the horizontal, the smaller the pulling effect and the greater the lifting effect. So the closer you get to a 90 degree angle, it'll be more so lifting rather than pulling it along. So your Fy will be your perpendicular or vertical components and your Fx 
will be your parallel horizontal component. This is just some shorthand you should know. We've got this little triangle and all I've shown you is that the Fy is pointing upwards and the Fx is pointing in that direction. As you can tell, we've drawn it head to tail. And we then have a resultant F as our um, resultant force and we've got the angle. So generally what happens if you have a cos of your angle, you will get Fx over F. So your Fx is generally your resultant force multiplied by your cos of the angle. Similarly, your sine of your angle will be Fy over your resultant force. And so your Fy is generally your resultant force times your sine of your angle. You can memorize these, just work them out on your triangles. It's up to you. All right, so we've got an example here. You can follow along in your worksheet. So three forces act on an object as below. So the question one is to find the horizontal and perpendicular components of only the eight. And then using that to determine the resultants of the three forces. This is a nice question because they have broken it up. They could just ask you the second question and you would automatically have to do that. The nice way of splitting it, however, is you will get more marks because if you do mess up in the first one, which I'm sure you won't, you will get all the marks for the second one because that will be carried through. Whereas if it's just one question where you make the mistake is where the marker will stop marking. So the more practice you do and the more marks you get and the less mistakes. Firstly, always define a direction. It is helpful to write it out wherever you want on your piece of paper. As long as you remember to, this will just make it a lot less confusing which directions are positive and negative and what you need to add and subtract. And it'll make the examiner's life a lot easier, which then means they'd be a lot more lenient on you. Firstly, we're going to draw the triangle and we're going to use trig, if you can imagine the triangle. In this case, what I've done is just use the formula. So we know that Fy is the force times sine theta. So Fy of the 8 newtons is sine 70 times 8, which is 7.52 newtons. Up. And the Fx of the 8 is cos 70 times 8, which is equal to 2.74 newtons to the right. Another helpful tip is it is very helpful to write the directions, what I mentioned before. So sometimes they will give you the positive or negative, or you can just intuitively do what I've done and made a general Cartesian plane axis, the positive and negative. Now we know that the Fx total is your 12 minus your 2.74, which is equal to 9.26 newtons left. Your Fy total is 7.52 minus 5, and so that's 2.52 newtons up. If you want to, you can always use your positive and minus the negative direction. However, if you know that that is bigger than that one, you can always just minus it and then just specify which direction it is or put a negative in front of it. It is up to you. Now we're going to draw the resultant, and you always have to double check. Does it make sense? Looking at this diagram, you know that it's going up and to the left, and so your resultant should be in that area. It should not be going down and to the right, for example. So we take our left and we displace our upwards like we normally do, head to tail method, and we draw in our resultant and our angle. Our r squared is equal to 9.26 squared plus 2.52 squared, and we get 9.6 newtons from your calculator. Next, we say the tan of theta, we get 2.52 over 9.26, and we get a theta of 15.22 degrees. You can write this answer in multiple ways. How I've written it is that the resultant is 9.6 newtons at 15.22 degrees to the 12 newton force. You could do it from the y-axis as well. You could make it a bearing, however you wanted to do it. Another thing I just wanted to say is it is good to label one and two to separate it. And the neater you write your work, the better. The next example says, by resolving the forces shown in the sketch, calculate the resultants of these forces. And I'm going to ask you to try attempt this on your own by drawing the appropriate triangles, diagrams, and appropriate trig. However, I will prompt you every few seconds on what we're going to do. So remember, our first step is to define direction. All right, hopefully you did that immediately. All I've done here is just showing you that you have to 
work out these components and note that they are head to tail. All right. Next, work out what these angles are. We know that that is 135 and that is 90. So that is. And then we know that that is also 90 and that is 60. So we know what that is. All right, so this is just to reiterate. We're working out the component fx and fy. Okay. All right, so you should have used 45 and 30. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to figure out your fx and your fy. We're going to say 7 times cos of 45 and 6 times cos of 30. And therefore, you should get 5 minus 4.95 minus 5.2, and you should get negative 5.15 newtons. Then for your Fy, remember, it's F times your sine of theta. 7 sine of 45 and 6 sine of 30. And then we minus the 8 plus 4.95, and you minus the 3 because it's in the same direction as the 8. So think about it, does it make sense? We've got one going to the right, two to the left, makes sense. Two down and one up, makes sense. Okay, what does the negative tell you? Direction. So remember we've assigned a direction, so now we know that these are to the left and down. Okay. So we've got to the left and we've got down. We rearrange our head to tail and we put in a resultant. So now our resultant squared will be your 5.15 squared plus your 6.05 squared. And your resultant is 7.95 newtons. Put in your angle. Tan of theta is equal to 6.05 divided by 5.15. And you get an angle of 49.59 degrees. So therefore, our 7.95 newtons is at 49.59 degrees from the horizontal. All right, I am going to give you about three minutes, I think, to attempt these questions, and then I shall go through them with you. You do have them in your workbook.
right, so I hope everyone had enough time to go over them. If not, just re listen to what I have to say. Um, so you have the answers and you can always attempt them before a test and exam is extra revision. What we're going to do is we're going to choose forward as the positive direction. We know that the forward horizontal force is 50 newtons and the second is 180 applied in the opposite direction. So we're going to say 50 minus 180, which gives you 130. What does the negative tell you? It is 130 newtons backwards. All right, you get one mark for your magnitude and one mark for your direction. Then the next one. So remember, this is an example of another vector, which is displacement. So we're going to choose east as the positive direction. Our change in displacement, change in x, is going to be 150 minus 70 plus 100, which will give you 180 meters east. One mark direction, one mark magnitude. All right, so number seven is a bit more complicated and it's a lot easier to draw a diagram. So it says a drone at point P is flown two kilometers north, five to the right or east, eight down, and then they want to know the resultant. If you think about it, if you go two kilometers up and eight kilometers down, what you really have gone is six kilometers down. The triangle is then five by six. You want to work out your x squared or your change in x, five squared plus six squared square rooted, which will give you 7.81 kilometers. And therefore, to work out your tan, we're going to say six over five, which will give you 50.19 degrees. So our change in x is equal to 7.81 kilometers on a bearing of 140.19. Remember, bearing is from north, so we have to add a further 90. All right. The next one is asking for magnitude and direction of the resulting force acting on the tugboat. We're going to say Fx is equal to 1,500 cos of 25 degrees, which will give you 1359,46 newtons to the right. If y is going to be 1,500 times sine of 25, which is equal to 633,93 newtons up. As they are identical, we know that that is then doubled. So our Rx is going to be 1359,46 times 2, which is 2718,92. And we know that since your Rys are in opposite directions, they cancel each other out. 633,93 up minus 633.93 down, which will be 0. And so our resultant is... 2718.92 newtons at a bearing of 90 degrees. And the reason that it is 90 degrees, there's no up or down force, and so it is exactly on the X line. So I hope all those attempts were all right, and if you have any questions, please do bring them up in the Q&A coming up. I have put together the slide as a thing to remember and tips. It should be in your worksheet as well. So remember to define your direction at the beginning. It makes it easier to get your results and direction correct, and it allows the examiner to understand how you are attempting the problem. This also comes in handy when people are marking, giving you feedback, and you can pick up how you got wrong, whether it was just the stress from the exam, because, you know, sometimes your calculator just doesn't work as well. I don't know how, but it, it happens to all of us. And you can just at least see if your direction is not the problem. And if you are given vectors in a question that are at an angle to the x and the y-axis on one or the other, resolve them into their separate components. So this is where um, you've got a 40 degree angle of the horizon, um, vertical, whatever. Resolve them into the x and y's, add them and get your resultants at an angle. And then, as you know, definitions are very important. Um, and you should start making your list of definitions by now because they are just a lot and it does count a lot in your exam. So a resultant vector by definition is the vector which has the same effect as all the component vectors added together, which makes sense. You don't want to be getting an answer that doesn't actually mean what the picture means in the first place. So just a tip here is to check the angle and the force makes sense. If all your angles are acting to the right of the Cartesian plane, but your answer says left, something may be a bit wrong. 
And another thing, applications come from understanding the basics. So understanding all what we've done will allow you to go into further more complex problems and incorporate more forces. Even though this is a lot of practical work, they can and will ask you for definitions, so do keep up to date with them, as I have said. All right, so anything gets a direction, you can just remember, you just go back to it. All right, team. So application or further examples. So we all know forces are vectors that have attitude and direction. Using these principles we have just discussed, you can add in other specific forces that can and need to be used. So for example, weight, tension, normal force, and frictional force. Okay, these are the main ones you will encounter, and you'll encounter them in different ways. So, this part of the PowerPoint will deal with weight. So, we will go into more detail on it later on. But for now, it's just to get you a little bit of an application on what we've just done without overwhelming you. Alrighty. So, definition. Write this down. The force with which an object is attracted to the Earth. Standard. Its equation is Fg is equal to mg. Your g is your acceleration due to gravity. So different schools might expect this to be differently. I'm not too sure. However, my school in particular, and I know a few schools who do, always say it's 9.8 meters per second squared, and m is the mass of the objects in kilograms. So I'd always remember your SI units. When horizontal, the force exerted on the surface by the object it's equal to its weight. However, if it is on a slope, which is most of the problems you will encounter, it can be broken down into parallel and perpendicular components of weight, which is what we've done before. So our weight is normally just straight down. So in this diagram, it is the red arrow straight down. Your weight will always be straight down. And so that is the force exerted on the surface by the object, remember that. All right, however, there are other forces that are happening here. So the parallel force is the force which causes the object to slide on the slope. So if you think about it, sometimes if you put something on a general slope or if you're walking down a slope and you sit down or skateboarding down a slope, sometimes it will start to slide down. This obviously is held back by something called friction, which we will go into later on. If it stays exactly where it is, it means your parallel and frictional force are equal. However, if it slides down, it means your parallel force is greater. And then you have your perpendicular component of a weight, and that's the force which the object presses into the surface. All right. And the force opposing that, based on Newton's laws, will be your normal force. Okay, so your normal force on a slope is not equal to your weight, it's equal to the perpendicular component of your weight. That is very important. To Okay, so sine theta is going to equal your F parallel over Fg. So the parallel component is equal to your weight times your sine theta. So that is similar to your Y component. Okay, then cos theta will be your F perpendicular over Fg. So your F perpendicular will be cos theta times your weight, which is similar to your X formula. Okay. All right, so we're going to attempt to calculate the forces of a 10 kilogram box and when theta is equal to 50. So first you have to have your diagram drawn. So this is just to calculate the forces. So I'm not looking for the results in force. This is just to go over this basic concept. Okay, so if our theta is 50 degrees and if our mass of the box is 10 kilograms, what we want to know is what is Fg? So remember Fg is equal to Mg, so your mass is 10 and we've got acceleration as 9.8, so we've got a 98 newton force of our weight. Okay, and also, also if it helps you, a color as much as you want during figuring out these problems, do whatever you can to help you understand these concepts and think through them as best as you possibly can. Okay. So we know that sine of theta is equal to F parallel over Fg. So we want to work out our F parallel, which is your Fg sine theta. So we've got 98 times sine of 50 degrees. Plug that into your calculator. And you get 75.07 newtons. Okay. Same with your F perpendicular will be cos theta times your Fg, 
which will be cos of 50 times 98. Plug that into your calculator and you get 62.99, so we'll approximate it to 63 newtons. Okay, so pretty straightforward. I am going to go into a bit more detail now, just on free body diagrams, so you can understand this a bit more. So free body diagrams are always drawn with a little circle, and you just draw the forces coming out of it. So we've got the weight going down, We've got the parallel force going like that, and we've got the perpendicular force going like that. So I'm just going to bring up very briefly topics that you should know on these type of diagrams. So remember that you've got a normal force, write down the definition of a normal force if you've forgotten, and then we've got our frictional force. Okay, so generally what happens in an exam if they ask you for a free body diagram and it is stationary your force of friction will be the same as your force of parallel and your force be that okay however this will not make sense to you if you think okay but then that just means that my weight is acting on it but remember your f parallel and your f perpendicular are your components of weight so you either just draw in your weight and you have these two coming out or you draw all four which will cancel each other okay hopefully that makes sense um, i might give you one examples and see how we are and then that should be this part done again so i hope you had a nice chance to attempt these there will be more mathematical and physics focused questions after these however i think it's very important just to get the basics and understanding we're going to label free body diagrams these are different from force diagrams remember because force diagrams doesn't really have many rules whereas a free body diagram has to have the circle and each arrow it has to be pointing away so we're going to split this into the three kilogram and the five kilogram one so we draw our circle and we have the weight going directly downwards. Remember then we've got the normal force, however it is not in the same direction as the weight because it would be equal to the perpendicular component. And then we add the frictional force which will be equal generally to the parallel component of weight. Then we know that it's being pulled up by another one, by the other block. So we add in a force called tension, and this has to be bigger than the frictional force. Then for the 5 kilogram one, we do the same with regards to weight, the normal force, and the friction. However, the tension is in the opposite direction, because obviously the block is dragging it down in a way, and there is another applied force which is opposite to the tension and the friction. Alright, nice easy marks for 9 marks, so we shall end it there. Hello again everyone and congratulations on finishing your first online lesson with TutorBox. 
live in conjunction with COVID-19 catch-up courses. I hope you've thoroughly enjoyed the concepts, examples, and attempting some of the questions on your own. I hope you engaged as much as possible and you really made the most out of it. That's all we ask of you. Just a reminder that there is a Q&A session and I really encourage you to tune in for the next few and to encourage anyone who might be interested. And with that, I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. It's not a matter of whether or not we can. Everybody can, but not everybody will. How to turn nothing into something. How tangible are ideas and imagination? Ideas that become so powerful in your mind and your consciousness, they seem real to you even before they become tangible. Imagination that is so strong that you can actually see it. You can actually see it. If somebody cannot see it when it is not here, then it will never be here. Start looking into the future of what you would like to accomplish, and where you would like to go, and the person you would like to be. Decide what you want and then act as if you already had it. And that is to believe that what you imagine is possible for you. So the first step is to imagine what's possible. Second step, to believe. Now here's the third step. And that is to go to work and make it real. You now go to work and make it a movement. You make it tangible. You make it viable. You breathe life into it, and then you construct it. You have a lot to offer. The fact that you're still here means that your business is not through yet. People don't do what they know in life, but what they do is they operate within the context of the vision they have of themselves. So write and draw and build and play and dance and live as only you can. Make up your own rules. The rules on what is possible and impossible were made by people who had not tested the bounds of the possible by going beyond them. You must change what's possible for you. You and only you are the subject that impacts the burning desire in your imagination. You are living and feeling as if your future dreams are a present fact. Will it be easy? No. Will it be challenging? Yes. So you've got to prepare yourself. You've got to develop yourself. As long as you're breathing, you've got some more work to do. There's something else for you to achieve. Guess what? You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. So now go and make interesting mistakes. Make amazing mistakes. Make glorious and fantastic mistakes. Break rules. Leave the world more interesting for your being here. Make good art. It is possible to start with nothing and become something.